and 1 Peter 3, 8 through 12. So he has talked about masters and government and spouses and um, just all types of different relationships on how to how we should look different, how we treat people differently according to um, how Christ has changed our lives. And so three eight. Finally, all of you be like minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and sees good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So the song that we sang this morning is, Every breath I take, I breathe in you. Every step I take is all about you, Jesus. Um, so I need all of you to look me in the face, those of you who have called Jesus your Lord and Savior, and say, that's me. Everybody, everybody, everything is about Jesus. Every conversation I get into, every car that cuts me off, every boss that treats me badly. Oh, I love you. Here's some cookies. <laughs> um, and so, it's funny, and I'm no different than you are, but Peter says we got to get rid of the evil. Our mouths do so much damage. The way we speak to people, the way we treat, a look can say a lot to people. Peter says we got to get rid of that. And we, we just go, we get up every morning and maybe some of us pray, some of us read the Bible, and then we go out and do life. And we give people nasty looks and we say nasty things and we treat people the way the world treats people. And Peter says we're not the world. We're not of this world anymore. We are followers of Jesus Christ and when we said we believe you Jesus and we believe you are the Messiah and we believe that you died for my sins and we believe that we have eternal life because of what you did on the cross for us and we believe everything you've done is good and right and we're going to do our best to follow you. Peter says we should really do that. Um, saying a prayer that we believe in Jesus and we believe and thank you for what you did on the cross and that I get to go to heaven. A prayer is nice. But once we receive that salvation, it's not about trying to be saved anymore. It's not about making ourselves happy. It's about sharing that with people. It's about sharing the love of Jesus with people. And we should look different. Do you look different? When you go out of here, when you're in your homes, when you're in your workplaces, when you're in public, when you're shopping, when you're driving, do you look different? Peter says we should look different. And we got to get rid of the evil in our lives. And that doesn't mean we're going to be able to. Uh, because good and evil, we always have those little voices inside us. And we always have that fight in our in our head going on. And Matthew 5, Jesus says it this way in Matthew 5. Verses 38 through 42. You have heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. How many of you like that? An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. The Old Testament. Yeah, that's what we're all about. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. We love the Old Testament in that aspect. But Jesus says, But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, 
hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Those are hard things. Those are, if somebody walked up and punched you, Doug, would you say thank you? Hit this side as well. Yeah. yeah, but Jesus tells us to do that. And why don't we? Because we want to repay evil with evil. We want to make ourselves feel good um, by not only punching them back, but maybe a few times. Um, knocking some sense into them. When, when somebody talks bad about you, um, how good are you at keeping your mouth shut? Jesus says, when some, and somebody is going to talk bad about you. I'll guarantee it. Karen? I know. Happens all the time. And sometimes silence is the best medicine. Um, I've told you a story before about a man and his wife who were getting divorced. And you know, you want to fight. If you've ever been in counseling with a man and a woman who are having issues, um, let one of them say what the other one did to them. And you know what happens? It's it, The fight is on. Well, you did this, and you did this, and you did this, and you did this. And, and all they're wanting is somebody to be on their side just to prove that they're better than this person. Keeping your mouth shut in one situ in most situations. Keeping your mouth shut. That's how Jesus defended himself. He kept his mouth shut because the truth came out. Usually when we fight and argue, we start saying things that are just, we just want to upset them. It has nothing to do with fixing anything. We just want to upset them as much as they've upset me. Peter says we got to stop doing that because it happens in our homes and it happens in our workplaces and it happens in the grocery store and it happens out on the road. Um, Jesus says we're different. Be different. Be holy because I'm holy, God says. And we have to work on that. In Romans 7, Paul puts it another way. Seven, fifteen through eight, seventeen. And did you read that? I have an angel on one shoulder and a devil on the other. I'm also deaf in one ear. Um, that's sadly probably pretty true with most of us. Um, Seven, fifteen. Through 817. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate to do, and if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is the sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I not but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. So this is Paul. This is one of the greatest apostles, um, did most of the writing in the New Testament. He has this fight going on. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is the sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. 
Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law has power to is powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what, it, what the flesh desires. But those who live according in accordance with the Spirit, have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are on, in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of the spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive throughout brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with the spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. So first of all, let me say that if you have this fight going on between good and evil, um, if there's this war going on inside of you, my understanding of what Paul said, that's a good thing. Because the Spirit of God lives in you, and that is going on. But Paul says, if, if there's no war going on, and you're living by the flesh, Christ doesn't live in you. The Spirit of God does not live there. And so we think we, we, we think about, oh man, I hate sin and I feel so bad. and I, I, That's good. Because that is the, the Spirit of God that is working in your life. The bad thing is, is the next day we just do it again. We can't be just content that the Spirit of God lives in us. We need to start being obedient to the Spirit. And being obedient to the Spirit brings about a sense of peace in all situations. So that fight that goes on with us is good, but we need to start feeding the Spirit of God. And so one thing that we need to do to feed the Spirit of God is we, we need to start reading our Bible and understanding who God is and, and what he's all about, because when the Spirit speaks to us, we want to make sure that we know that that is the Spirit of God. We were talking about false teaching this morning in class. How do you know if you are being taught falsely? It goes against the word of God. And if you don't know the word of God, you know what happens? You're drug away. Satan's good. He can pull you away. He did it to Israel all the time. They would, they would go into a place and then they would give their sons and daughters and themselves to marriage and, and to pagans. And, and then they would start worshiping pagan idols and and. God says, the Spirit of God lives in you. There's going to be a war inside. It's going to be a fight. Paul says, it is a horrible fight, and I constantly do the things that I don't want to do. So, first of all, if you have the Spirit of God in you, that battle should be going on. Um, 
Let's go on to 1 Peter 3, 13 through 20. through 20. Who is going to harm you if you are eager, eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Also be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Keep a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, and the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. To those who were disobedient long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. So how do we respond to malicious people? How do we respond to people that don't like us? How do we respond to people who tell incorrect things about us? How do we respond to people who want to tear us apart? Jesus says, tell people what Jesus did for you in your life. We don't have to fight over things that um, they talk about. Your testimony, just like Robin said, there are miracles that happen every day. Our breath. Do you know what keeps our lungs going in and out, bringing oxygen in and, and for providing? I have no idea. There, I don't know why this breath keeps breathing in and out. There is not like an air compressor that is that is pumping my lungs up and keeping me like the breathing machine. That's not happening. That is a miracle. God has done things in my life that he didn't do in your life because it's my story. And if you want to know how God transformed my life, ask me sometime, I'll tell you. Um, but God transformed my life into a different person. When I used to work construction, when I used to be out in the field, and um, I could cuss out truck drivers. I could cuss out anybody and treat them the worst possible way. I made them feel about this big. I even cussed out my boss once. I, you don't cuss out your boss, but I did it. Because that made me feel big and bad. And, and that was just every day. That was just my life because I was part of the world and that's how I seen the world acting. And in construction, that is how life is. I say that, that is the stereotype of how it is because I've met lots of people in the construction world today that love Jesus and it shows. But when God, when I, when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, the speech that Peter talks about it made me, I felt bad when I, when I belittled somebody, when I, when I cussed at them, and when I, I felt bad. Not bad enough to change, but I felt bad. And gradually, I started to change. I started to see that person as a person. And I didn't do that by my will. That was the Spirit of God in me showing me and, and giving me the eyes of how God sees people. God transformed me, not me, not my will, because it was pretty easy to, to chew people out and cuss at them and, and treat people. That was easy. What was hard was to treat people with respect who treated me that way. And the only reason I could do that is because God transformed my life, and he's still transforming my life. And every day I try to learn to do better. Some days I don't. But God transformed me. Peter says, Jesus, the Spirit of God is who transforms you. And when you are transformed and when you these miracles happen and when things are happening and people say, man, you didn't used to be like that. Well, let me tell you why. I can't explain to you this Jesus that nobody can see. I can't explain to you, but I can tell you what this Jesus that I can't see did in my life. And I can tell you how I feel because of what this Jesus did in my life. And you can tell me it's not true, but it's true. 
I watched a movie. We watched a movie yesterday, Greater. It's called Greater. It's a it's about a football player. He's a young kid that grew up at his mama called him a big boy. And he was overweight. And he looked and throwing his, he didn't look very coordinated either. But he went to play football for Arkansas. Long story short, he he, he got that off. But he was treated badly. He was baptized as a young boy, and the pastor told him, he said, you are a new person in Christ. Now go be that new person. And he took that seriously. And people treated him badly and, and lied to him. And, and But every time he responded, he responded in a right way. And he got made fun of for doing that as well. But in the end, people started to see that, man, this this guy is different. He is somebody that that I respect. And people started coming to him and, and, and getting his autographs. And he was he was making an impact on the world through his football game. And it was not because he was a great football player, it was because of his art, his ethics and his work. And, and he made himself into a great football play, player. And he played for Arkansas, and then he, he ended up getting recruited by the Indianapolis Colts. And this was some little chubby kid. That had no, but the whole story was about how people's lives were transformed into somebody else because of the way he lived his life. He treated people with respect. He, he, he honored people, and he loved people. And then he was killed two weeks before he started for the Colts. Um, and this was based on a true story. But this kid's life, the transformation in his life, and and the way he dealt with people, always right, always well, always respected them. He brought guys that made fun of him into a Bible study. Their lives were transformed because of the way he treated them. Not because, not because they got into the word, but it's because of some Christian treated them right when they didn't deserve to be treated right. That's what Peter is talking about. That is how people come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior because Christians treat people right when they don't deserve to be treated right. This guy transformed. People's lives were transformed by Christ because of the way he treated them. That's why it is so important. That's why Peter keeps talking about if, if you are being beaten by your slave master, love him. If you are being beaten by, if you are in bad relationships and you at work or wherever, treat them right. Treat them well. That doesn't mean you go in and get beat up all the time, but treat them well. Treat them differently because we are different. Brandon was the name of the football player. He treated people differently, regardless of whether they deserved it or not. And that's what Peter is saying. We are different. We are transformed by Jesus Christ. Jesus treated people differently regardless of how he was treated. Peter is telling the church that is the way we should be. That is the way we should look. Matthew 10, 16 through 20. Matthew 10, 16 through 20. He says, I am sending you out like sheep among, among wolves. Therefore, be shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogue. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, or it will, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Now, the likelihood of us being arrested or beaten or flogged is slim to none in the United States. But the likelihood of us being in a situation where in our mind we are being judged or we are being treated... Um, God says the Holy Spirit look towards the Holy Spirit let the Holy Spirit do the work 
We, we shy out of doing things because we don't know what to say. Well, if every breath I take is in Jesus and every step I take is in Jesus, then every word that I speak is in the spirit of Jesus. And so we look towards the spirit. And those are opportunities. Those are opportunities to be the light in a dark world. Give the Spirit of God room to work in your life. We put all the pressure on ourselves and, oh, I don't know the Bible very well. I don't know how to, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. So sometimes we just, we don't do nothing or we revert back to the way we did when we lived in the world. Peter says, live differently. You don't have, and Paul says, you don't have the power to live differently because the sinful nature is so strong. But what those of you who have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior do have is the <coughs> Spirit of God that can handle all those situations. And so we need to stop. We need to stop and rely on the Spirit of God. We don't give the Spirit of God any power at all most of the time. We talk about the Spirit, but the Spirit is our to Jesus today. That is who walks with us. That is who teaches us. That is who leads and guides us. So we need to allow the spirit to work and to talk and to, to be that guide when we don't have the power to overcome sin and, and malice in the way we treat people. We need to stop and allow the spirit to do the job that the spirit was designed to do. 1 Peter 3, 21 through 22. start back at 20. To those who were disobedient long ago and God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built, in it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through the water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from, from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is, is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. So I just wanted to say a little bit about baptism. Some, some places say baptism is a requirement for salvation. We don't believe baptism is a requirement for salvation. We believe baptism um, is you taking your old life, burying it, dying, and coming up with the new life in Christ. And so the little bit about Jesus going down into the, the realms and speaking to the people on it, you can read commentaries after commentaries after commentaries what that what that means, and I'm not going to go into what all that means. Um, but it talks about baptism. And when I think of baptism, somewhat of like a marriage license. This seal, when you get in front of people and you are baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, you are saying that Jesus is my Lord and Savior and I am a new person. And I am doing this in front of all of you. And, and that's where we become a family. And, and we should be keeping each other accountable. And we should be keeping each other in line and helping each other um, and during those tough times and, and living life together. But baptism is, is it's, it's significant. It's very important. So with that said, um, this summer, you know, we, we'll be having a baptismal service. So if you are at all interested in being baptized, if you've never been baptized, if you'd like to be baptized again, um, um, come and speak to me or Mike or Robin or Julie or Shelly. Um, John 14, 16 says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. That is the Holy Spirit. Today's lesson is all about the Holy Spirit. You have no power um, to overcome the sinful nature by yourself. 
by willpower. Willpower, when you do something based on willpower, you are living by the law. You are saying that I'm not going to do that because it's not right. That is living by the law. I am not going to cuss at that person today because God says it's not right. That is living by the law. Living by the law brings death. The way Jesus says to you respond to that is you love that person. And when you start learning how to love people in all situations, the law goes out the window because you're doing it perfectly. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, abiding by the law because when you love people correctly you are abiding by the law and so it is fulfilled by your love the Holy Spirit who is given to us God promises that when you say Jesus you are my Lord and Savior and I will do my best to follow you it's yours the Holy Spirit lives within you and that is where all of our power comes from and we got to learn to draw on that power Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Um, that is breathing, Jesus. Stepping with Jesus, um, that is walking hand in hand with Jesus. We are being transformed daily. We should be being transformed daily. We should be working on being trans, not so that we look better in God's eyes, but so that people around us will maybe come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Ephesians 1.13 says, and, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of salvation. When you believe, you are marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Romans 10.9 and 10. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. It is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you profess. And for Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, you are saying, I am going to follow Jesus. I'm going to walk with Jesus. I'm going to, I'm going to do my best to do what Jesus asked me. And that is all through the Holy Spirit. And so we need to be reading. Don't take my word for what I say. Don't take anybody's word for what they say about the Bible. Get in the word. Read God's word. Test and approve what people are telling you. See that it is true. And, and by doing that, you're going to build your courage and your strength. And, and you're going to start to acknowledge the spirit of God that is talking with you because it correlates with God's word. Um, I want to read that whole passage that I just did. Um, 3, 8, that whole verse, and I'm going to do it in the message because, uh, I don't know, it just, it, it really hit me the way that they wrote it in the message. So I'm going to read 1 Peter 3, 8 through the end. It says, summing up, be agreeable, be sympathetic, be loving, be compassionate. Be humble. That goes for all of you. No exceptions. No retaliation. No sharp tongue sarcasm. Instead, bless. That's your job. To bless. You'll be a blessing and also get a blessing. Whoever wants to embrace life and see the day filled up with good, here's what you do. Say nothing evil or hurtful. Snub evil and cultivate good. Run after peace for all your worth. God looks on all this with approval, listening and responding well to what he's asked. But he turns his back on those who do evil things. If with heart and soul you're doing good, do you think you can be stopped? 
even if you suffer for it, you're still better off. Don't give the opposition a second thought. Through thick and thin, keep your hearts at attention in adoration for Christ, your master. Be ready to speak up and tell anyone who asks why you're living in the way you why you're living the way you are and always with the utmost courtesy keep a clear conscience before God so that when people throw mud at you, none of it will stick. They'll end up realizing that they're the ones who need a bath. It's better to suffer for doing good if that's what God wants than, than to be punished for doing bad. That's what Christ did definitely suffering because of other sins, the righteous one for the unrighteous one. He went through it all, was put to death and then made alive to bring us to God. He went and proclaimed God's salvation to earlier generations who ended up in prison of judgment because they wouldn't listen. You know, even though God waited patiently, all the days that Noah built his ship, only a few were saved then, eight to be exact, saved from the waters by the water. The waters of baptism do that for you, not by washing away dirt from your skin, but by presenting you through Jesus' resurrection before God with a clear conscience. Jesus has the last word on everything and everyone from angels to armies. He's standing right along God, and what he says goes. I love the part where it talks about people slinging mud at you. And it says, act in a way so where it's not going to stick. And what happens? I think in Proverbs, it talks about heaping um, coals on people by being really good to them. <laughs> um, being good to people can convict them. Being good to them can show them what Christ has done in your life. Being good to them can hopefully eventually lead them to salvation through Jesus. We are different people. If Jesus is your Lord and Savior, we are different people. And we need to look different. And if you're not having that fight going on in your head, I, I, I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm not saying anything. But if you are not having that fight going on to your, in your head, you should rethink about your relationship with Jesus Christ. We are different people. The Holy Spirit is alive. It's not somebody that just sits in there and, and lets you live life. He is constantly battling for you because Satan is constantly battling for you. He's not going to sit aside and let Satan take you. There's always going to be that battle. So I, I am saying, we need to rely on the Holy Spirit. And if you do not have the Holy Spirit, the way you receive the Holy Spirit is to believe what Jesus did for you on the cross. Believe that he is the Son of God. Believe it in your heart that he died on the cross and that, that God raised him from the dead. Believe that. Trust that. And as last week when I talked about belief, if you, if you find that hard to believe, um, say that. I believe in my heart, but I can't believe in my heart. Help me believe. Help me to understand. And give God the opportunity to help you to understand. I will guarantee you that he will do everything in his power to help you to understand how that, how that is true and how that is good and how that is right. And I will guarantee you that things will happen inside of you that can only be linked to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God, I want to, first of all, I am so thankful for the, your word, for the Bible. Um, I am thankful for people here on this earth that were sinful people who were maybe even bad, rotten people, that you could take a person like that and transform them into a follower of Jesus Christ and a great example of who he is. And so God, this week as we go out of here, I pray that you would also do that in us. That we would, we would look similar. That we would reflect who Jesus is to people. God, I'm asking you to trigger things. I'm asking for your Holy Spirit to fight for us and to, to help us engage in situations that will bring a light 
God, there are a lot of people that live in the dark. There are a lot of people that are living without hope. There are people daily committing suicide because they don't know what love looks like. God, I am asking you that this group of people, that this week we could love people, that we can bring light in a dark area, that we can bring hope to the hopeless, that we could just love somebody that don't deserve it. God, I pray that we would learn to, to walk and breathe Jesus always. I pray that we would learn to lean on your Holy Spirit more. God, you're a good God. Thank you for constantly pursuing us, constantly helping us. So give us the eyes to see people as you see them not as who they are, not as what the world has made them to be, but help us to see them as who you made them to be. God, help us to love this week. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Any final words? This is just a bit of information, Scott, but I was one of the truck drivers. <laughs> Oh, now what have you got to say? <laughs> Look at us today. We're both here serving Christ together. That's what Christ can do to people's lives. Yep, that's right. When I was in high school, I had this conversation with a friend about that. You know, it's like, I, I'm not sure that I'm a true friend or whatever. And she told me that her dad said the same thing I've never mentioned. If you are wondering and thinking about it, Absolutely. Absolutely.